So good morning and welcome to another edition of Better Business, Better Life. Today I am joined by the charming Henry Das, who is um, based over in the US. And Henry is a serial entrepreneur. He has um, run a number of businesses from IT to leasing to spec houses, you name it. Uh, But in more recent times, he has gone into coaching and he has written a book called FQ, which is Financial Intelligence. So welcome, Henry. Pleasure to have you here. I'm uh, very happy to be here, Deborah. Great. So um, obviously a very well accomplished businessman yourself. Would you like to give us a little bit of your personal history and give us your professional and personal best in your life? Okay, so um, I started as an entrepreneur about 30 years ago, Um, just sort of hung up a shingle and said, uh, I'm an entrepreneur, kind of, you know, that old, that old chestnut. Um, I've had business partners, I've had a couple of them. Uh, Sometimes it works out really well. Uh, Sometimes one plus one equals three, sometimes um, one plus one equals (laughs) <laughs> minus, minus three infinity <laughs> yeah. so we all know that one um so that's been pretty uh, interesting as far as um the business best i would say probably writing this book my book is called fq financial intelligence i mean it was looking back on it it was a pretty herculean task to write 120,000 words uh real compendium about you know, anything and everything I thought people needed to know about finance. So, so that I would put, uh, that I would chalk up as a, uh, one of the business best and a personal best would be, uh, I'm a golfer. And last summer I broke 80 for the very first time. In fact, my last round of the season before we closed up with the cold weather, I shot 78. I'm very proud of that. That is so. awesome. Well done. Okay, so the book, yes, I mean, I must admit, uh, uh, trying to write a book on financial intelligence, I think that um, that sounds quite challenging. So, so why? What made you want to write a book around it? You know, I was I was in Bangkok and I was at a conference um, uh, with a a lot of uh, probably about three four hundred digital nomads, people who write, people who have um, location independent businesses. I had a half a dozen of my clients there, some who I had never met in the flesh before. And one of the days was were these mastermind groups, and I found myself at a mastermind group with a bunch of coaches, and we were talking about our, you know, our Jim Collins BHAG, you know, the big hairy audacious goal. And I said, uh, you know, I've been trading the markets and managing my own money since I was in high school, and I always thought it would be nice to, you know, build a course where I could teach people what I've learned. And they kind of, you know, everybody at the table was half my age, and they're all like, "Well, you better get on that, dude, because you're not getting any younger." And uh, and I did. Um, that was really the impetus. I got home and I wrote it all in less than two months. I think it was about 50 days. It took me to write this. Um, wow. yeah, okay. I basically just plowed through it and it was, uh, I started at the beginning yeah. and I finished at the end. I have written 11 screenplays. It's one of the things that I do as like a little, little side thing. I've never sold anything and nothing's been, <laughs> been made. I've entered them in contests. Then the very first one I wrote that way, I started at the beginning And then uh, I finished at the end, but that's the only time the rest. Now I'm writing another book about business and I'm hot hopscotching around, Mm -hmm. you know, I'm a little thing comes to me and I write a little bit and I'll piece it all together later. Fair enough. So tell us a little about about your business history, because it's obviously this knowledge to write this book has come from you actually being a serial entrepreneur and running many, many businesses. Tell us a wee yeah. bit about yeah some of those and some of the the highs and the lows of running a business. Well, I look at businesses. Um, you know, the the origin story of businesses basically fall into two buckets. There's the what I call the accidental business, right? Yeah. Uh, and then there's the purposeful business. So in the latter case, you sort of sit down and you write a business plan. You look at all the things that you're going to do. You you, you vet your idea and you raise money and and you go at it. Mm-hmm. And there's a chance you'll succeed. And there's also a chance you're going to fail. Uh, the accidental business is more like, a, hey, you know, I need some help. Like a friend of yours, I ask, I need some help. I'm having trouble. That's how mine started. Uh, I had a friend of mine who was having trouble sourcing computers. I said, let me take a crack at it. I took a crack at it. I did it. I didn't know, have any idea what I was doing. I did it. It was successful. I made a couple of bucks and then he started feeding me deals. And before you know it, I had done, I think, $600,000 worth of business in about a year and a half. And I said, 
this is a real business. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm running out of my apartment. I'm running out on credit cards. Uh, it wasn't until I actually quit my job that I turned my attention to, okay, how do I structure this in a way so that it'll be successful? Okay. Um, so that's, that's kind of how, you know, that's kind of how things go. And then the business will run its course. That first business ran for, you know, 10 years. Um, and then I had a falling out with my business partner. And so I had to pivot into something. He had to pivot into something. It was a couple of years of hell to do that. Yep. Um, and then I, you know, I found something new. I got into the home, you know, building home theaters for people. And um, it's still, it's still scratched that, you know, tech itch that I had. Um, but I had to build a whole um, sales and marketing organization, which, which was my partner's responsibility in the, in the previous incarnation. So I had to learn a whole different skill set. So where do you think your natural skill set lies? Like we talk about our unique ability, the things that we're really great at, that's sort of like God-given talent. Where would Mm -hmm. you say yours naturally lies? Well, the, the, the business book that I'm working on is, has the unlikely title of codfish and it grew, the the name grew out of a a coaching session with actually with an Australian client a number of years ago, where we were trying to look at the different buckets that you have to play in as a business. And so we came up with customer support, operations, development, finance, infrastructure, sales and marketing, and human resources. Mm-hmm. And then I challenged all my other clients to find the, you know, like in the eighth bucket, right? It was like a con, you know, find me something that isn't covered in one of these seven. We never did, never came up with anything that wouldn't fit into one of these buckets. Now, again, going back to your origin story of your business, if you look at it as the entrepreneur, your business was born out of one of these, I call them silos, right? Mm -hmm. My first business was born out of the customer support silo. I was selling computers, a commodity item. If you're selling a commodity item, you better have some value add that's going to make people want to buy this from you because they can buy it from anybody. Mm -hmm. If you want to compete on price, well, then you know what that is. That's a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. That's just margin compression until nobody can make any business. Uh, except the people who are just so gigantic like Amazon that they just crowd out everybody with their sharp elbows and they make what they make and they own the market. Um, So if I look at those seven, whether it be me or any entrepreneur that I might be coaching, the way I generally define it is you're going to have two that are really, really good that you, you know, you kick ass at, you're going to have three that you're, you know, fair to middling. I'm okay at it. And you're probably going to have one or two that are your Achilles heel. Yep. And it's been pretty consistent. Um, For me, I would say that it is probably the customer support and the finance side, which are really my, my strong suits. Mm. Um, and my absolute Achilles heel, um, which won't come as any sh- shock to anybody who knows me, is marketing. Right. Okay. <laughs> right. I mean, this is a piece of marketing here, um, but uh, you know, I grew up in a in a uh, in an era of um, put your nose to the grindstone, do your work, um, don't call attention to yourself. Uh, good things will happen if you work hard Mm -hmm. it doesn't work that way (laughs) you figure that out (laughs) right you figure that out very quickly um that the cream does not rise to the top that there are all sorts of head shakingly inferior products out there that people have spent an enormous amount of marketing dollars on Mm -hmm. with the idea that don't worry, as soon as, you know, we're going to get eyeballs, we're going to get a clientele and then we'll fix everything that really sucks about our product. (laughs) That's just kind of, kind of how, how it's done. I'll tell you an interesting story about when I was developing this um, as a, as a course and I had, you know, written a hundred, thousand words and had all of the, I spent an enormous amount of time. So a friend of mine who coaches people who are exiting the military, he sends me a thing and says, you know, I'm, I got this course and I'm going to sell it. And what do you think about all of this material? I said, uh, 
you know, and he's got all this marketing material. And I said, yeah, it's, it's really great. Could I see the actual, like, you know, coursework? He goes, oh, I haven't written any of that stuff. I'm going to, I'm going to, I got to market it and make sure that there's a, a, a there are people out there who are going to buy this. Yeah. And once I get enough people who are going to buy this, well, then I'll use that money to, to, to build the course. <laughs> and I said, well, you know what, compared to the way I did it, I have to be honest. I think that's the smarter way to go. Yeah. And it's the way people are encouraged to do it as well. I mean, I'm, I'm, I trained in market validation under Dr. Rob Adams, actually, who's a, who's a fellow American. And, you know, he always says that you are your best to spend um, as much time working through the validation as you're going to spend on actually developing the product. Otherwise, you can mm. find yourself developing the most amazing, you know, IT technology stuff, but nobody actually really wants it. That, that no, <laughs> nobody knows about it. Yeah. Right? Or, exactly. or worse than that, you can develop something, not test it in the marketplace, go out there and launch it and realize that it is just a yeah a complete matter well well i knew i knew that people needed to level up their financial yeah. game there was no there's no question about that mm. um you look at the uh, entities like robin hood and some of these other um you know fintech a lot of money has gone into fintech yeah. but what what they've what they've done is you've given people this my opinion you're you're giving them a race car that goes really really fast but you haven't taught them how to drive mm -hmm. right and yeah. what i'm trying to do is teach people to drive yeah but and I think all they really want is the shiny race car yeah <laughs> and I think you're right. I mean, often we go into business and I, I myself had a number of businesses as well. Probably my Achilles heel is more the finance side of things. Um, and, you know, you, you're very, very passionate about what you do, but if you've never run a business before. You don't actually understand all the different facets of it and what needs to be done. And it's the mm -hmm. finances that will ultimately kind of, well, um, any of the ops, sales and marketing or finance can kill you. But quite often it is the financials that end up being the issue for businesses. I see it all the time. I yeah. get I get clients who come in and, and, and ah, they just, they just don't know anything about, they figure if there's money in their bank account, that yep. they must be making money. And it's like, have you ever heard about receivables and payables <laughs> and some really, really basic stuff. And then the other, the other silo that I see a lot of problems <clears throat> is operations. They yep. just don't really know how to operate. And that that's kind of the hardest thing to learn for uh, many entrepreneurs, especially, you know, as, as you scale up, right? So you're a, you're a two person shop when you start and now you've got 20 head count. Now you've got 50. Now you've got a hundred. This beast is getting rather unwieldy and you can't run this like you ran it when you were bootstrapping. Yep. So you've got to ask yourself, well, you know, I had all these, I had these great skills. I had, I had the, the customer support and the finance silo down pat, but I'm not great at operations. And now uh, I've got this sprawling enterprise. I'm not very good in, in human resources. Mm -hmm. um, how do I manage this? Right. It's, it's, it's vexing. So on the surface, you're super successful, but what's behind the curtain there is is just cobbled together with spit and glue. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so how did you fill your gaps in your business? So you know, recognizing that sales and marketing potentially is your Achilles heel. What did you do to to fill hire those people? Gaps? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, yeah. Uh, I wrote a thing that's uh, a, a, a little PDF. It's about twenty five page PDF. You can download it for free off my website. Five reasons small businesses fail. And I've done yeah. a, um, and I've done a, uh, I have a deck and I've done it live back, back in the day when you used to be able to, to do things live. Um, <laughs> I, I vaguely remember those days. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Vaguely. Right. And number two is hiring. Yep. You know, when I ask people, I ask the audience, tell me the last person you hired, what was the process? It's like, well, I needed a, you know, I needed a, a, a developer. And so my friend's cousins, dental hygienist knew was acquainted with somebody who just got out, you know, this terrible, terrible stories of, of um, just not going through, uh, you know, an SOP, not following a standard operation, uh, operational procedure for how do I find talent and not taking the time to evaluate that talent. I mean, when I, I'll give you a simple example. When I hired a, co a copy editor for my book and 
until I went to one of these seminars, I didn't know what a copy editor was. Um, and so I did some research. So I went on a, a site that's called the Editorial Freelancers Association, all professionals. I put a two sentence ad out yep. and I got 60 resumes in 24 hours. And I went through every single one of them and I picked nine people and I sent out invitations to interview with me and seven of them responded. It, it took a lot of, a lot of work. Mm -hmm. Part of it was educating myself on what the talent pool is like, because you don't want to put an ask out there. That's what I call um, looking for a pink unicorn sitting on a rainbow, <laughs> right? Some people go out there. Oh, here's what I want. I want all of this, but I'm only going to pay them $13 an hour. Yeah. It's like, you're not going to get that, dude. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. So be realistic. But it was a process and it took me weeks, but I, I wasn't in a rush because this was a super important Higher, and this is just for a project. This is mm -hmm. not even for someone that I'm you're going to put on salary. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's you need to put the time and the effort into that because the stakes are so high in human capital, mm -hmm. and mistakes can set you back. Right, mm -hmm. one bad hire can set you back for months, or can even, in some cases, kill your business. Completely First. agree. And I think, you know, we've got even more strict um, employment laws over here in New Zealand as well. So if somebody doesn't work out, it's not just a case of saying, hey, this isn't working out. Off you go. Uh, we can't do oh, that over here. So it's we know. have very liberal laws here and having coached people in Central America and Europe. I mean, not a client in Austria. Everything is collectively bargained. Mm. Right. It's a very, very different environment. So in uh in central america you've got to offer them severance for every year that they worked for you yeah um that's not mandatory here in the u.s we're kind of the wild west for hiring <laughs> <Yeah>. here <laughs> I, I was very fortunate to um to have john spence come and talk at one of my events and he was just talking about you know if somebody doesn't work out you just fire them it's like you might do that in the u.s not quite so much yeah, over here. <laughs> it's not quite how it works no. everywhere so but um we, we were very fortunate to spend a couple of hours at patrick Len lencioni um yesterday and he was saying that you know when you're hiring people you actually should not just follow all that process you just talked about but also take them out somewhere take them out underwear shopping take them out to um, a, a lunch or something have somebody deliver the wrong lunch meal to them and just see how they actually respond in every take them on the golf place. course well yeah right? that's a great yeah, idea that, yeah that's a great place to take to take yeah. them because you will you will see everything about them <laughs> right do they cheat yep right do they get angry when things because it's a very very difficult game yes. so um and tell a lengthy you a game too so you're getting quite a bit of time with them aren't you you're going to get four or five hours yeah you know, with them and yet and there's a lot of downtime while you're waiting for other people to hit or while you're looking for balls in the woods mm -hmm. <laughs> so <Yep. laughs> so yeah you get to I, see people's true colors i love it i love it okay and so um Tell me a little bit more about the actual book and the course. So people who who would take the course or read the book, what are they, what are they like to get from it? What is the, the key takeaways from that, doing that? Well, the way I structured it is, you know, like a, like a screenwriter, it's a three, I, I put it into three acts. So the first act is starts with the psychology of money. So understanding how, what your tendencies towards money are. Are you living in scarcity? Or are you living in abundance? There's no point in yeah. teaching you how to trade stocks if you're too sheepish to ever put a trade on because mm -hmm. you're worried that it's going to go down. And I see that all the time. Yeah. But it's also about getting your personal balance sheet, your personal income statement, your cash flows. Really, for many people, it's the very first time in their life that they've actually sat down and said, okay, this is what I'm worth. Mm -hmm. Right. This is what I have. My house, my mortgage, my cars, my personal property, my stocks, bonds, whatever it might be. They may have absolutely no clue. Mm -hmm. Again, they may think, well, you know, I'm not broke, so I must be OK. And then I have a chapter that I call the thick green line where I look at not only today, but but the what we call contingent liabilities. Like. What's looming for you? later on down the road. If you're 30 years old, it's not unusual in the US for people to get to be 30 years old and have a net worth of zero, right? right. With the student debt and, and other headwinds on people. So think about that. You're 30 years old. You might be out of school for 10 years yep. and you've got no money, hmm. right? You're at, you're at zero. When my wife and I got married, we had a net worth of zero. I was 31, she was 29. Hmm. 
within five years, we had seven figures of, I'm not saying this to be braggadocious, but within five years, we had seven figures uh, in net worth. And we've never had less than that. You know, we were off to the races. That took a plan and it took a lot of hard work. It didn't happen accidentally. Not just going to happen by getting a high paying gut job, because you know, the more you make, the more you spend. Spend, yeah, absolutely. So right. it's design your life before. Exactly. And then the, so, yeah. the second six chapters, is the second act is, okay, now I got some money. What do I do with it? How do I invest it? How do I buy a house? You know, what sort of asset classes do I want to um, be involved in? Do I want to be, you know, do, do I have FOMO and, and want to be a crypto trillionaire or whatever it is? Or yeah. is it more like, No, I've had a a bunch of clients recently where it's been very real estate related. And I just got my real estate license here in the state of Connecticut. So I'm now a legitimately a a, a realtor. So I can speak not only authoritatively from my own experience, but also um, I can peek behind the curtain because I'm behind the curtain now. Mm -hmm. Um, And then the third act is kind of all the mishmash of other things. I have a chapter that I call Gypsies, Tramps and Thieves, which is which was my favorite one to write because it's like, all the ways that people are trying to steal your money, right? <laughs> I mean, it's just <laughs> one after another scams. I talk about the lottery and other things where it's like, if you want to buy a scratch off game every once in a while, okay, no big deal. But if you find yourself in a situation where you need that endorphin rush from money, that's bad. I tell people like when I talk to people to teach and I teach some trading, I, I tell them, and I've said this many times on podcasts, if your trading is not incredibly boring, then you are doing something wrong. Mm-hmm. It needs to be incredibly boring. You want to make boring, boring, boring money. Mm-hmm. Same thing applies for entrepreneurship. If you're, if the business you're running is a roller coaster, right? Uh, ask yourself, is that really what I want? Mm-hmm. Or do I just want I, I sort of tongue in cheek called them stupid businesses, right? You just want a lot of people. It's really, you know, you just want a stupid business, something that flies beneath the radar. It's predictable, reasonably predictable. There's not a stampede of people that are coming in, trying to capitalize on it. There's not, not a gold rush around it. A, you know, a predictable bread and butter, you know, good margin business. They're out there. Mm-hmm. They're just not very sexy. And let's face it, sex sells. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> okay. And I know that you now do, you now coach, you do a lot of coaching with um, entrepreneurial businesses in that kind of what we would call the mid market. So the ones that are already established, already up and running. Um, right. Yeah. Tell us a little bit more about that. Tell me what you, you know, who do you love to work with? Why? And how do you help? Well, um, I, I bill myself as a bespoke, which is a which is a fancy word for custom. So I'm a bespoke coach, yep. you know, as opposed to you know the entrepreneurial operating system, which is which is a system that designed for you to follow, or something like Vern Harnish's Rockefeller Habits, which you yep. may have heard of. Yeah, no, another I'm you know, Vern, that Vern, too. Yep. <laughs> yeah, Vern. I know Vern, and he's one of the founders of EO. Yep. Um, then there's great stuff in all of those things. Mine is a, my, my practice is a little bit different. Um, my job is to kind of figuratively speaking, speaking, crawl into your head and figure out which of these silos are your, are your strong ones and which are the ones that we're going to have to do some work on, not necessarily to make you a guru at it, but to figure out how you're going to, in many ways, manage around it, mm. right? How are you going to make good hires in the marketing arena, right? If marketing is not your strong suit, as opposed to just doing it trial by error, you know, (laughs) as I call it. Um, So that's, that's really the, the main imprimatur. I call myself a coach approach strategic advisor. So I did a year of coach training um, on a, on a path to become a certified ICF coach. But when I finished it, I discovered that it's just too limiting. You know, there, there are, there's so much about from my entrepreneurial experience that I'm, I'm leaving off the table if they're on the table, if I follow these, these strict rules. Yeah. So I said, I'm not going to The ICF has got some goes. pretty strong guy. It's pretty, pretty strong frameworks that you have to follow. And I think you're right. They're, you- they're very, and they're, and they're, they're, they're really good. I mean, yeah. I, I learned an, an enormous, I didn't realize how much I learned until I actually went back a couple of years later 
uh, I went to a school called Coachville and Coachville, once you're a student, it's kind of evergreen and you can go back and take classes. And when I first took the, uh, took the class, I was like a deer in the headlights. I'm like, wow, I, don't, I know nothing. And I was a successful businessman, you know, 50 year old successful businessman. And I was like, and then a couple of years later I did. It and it's like, wow, the game really slowed down. All of a sudden it's like, oh yeah, yeah. I, I, I get this now. Yeah. But there are times um, as an entrepreneurial coach where you just have the answer. Mm. So am I going to go through silly, torturous games with my client for them to discover? Or am I just going to give them the answer? Yeah. yeah. Sometimes it just makes sense to give them the answer. I'm a bit like you. I, I also didn't go down the ICF route because it was so restrictive. And I think that being a business owner myself, you know, sometimes we have to put the mentor hat on. And like you said, actually say, I've been here, I've done this. This is how this is exactly. what's happening. Um, and then other times we're a coach and we can, you know, which is where we are very much only about asking the questions to help them get the right. And answers. sometimes you're just a cheerleader, right? Yeah, yeah, Saying, yeah. hey, you know, take a breath, yes. enjoy a big win, yeah. right? Enjoy it, right? Yeah. Savor it because they're they're tough. Yeah. You know, they don't come by that often, you know, bad beats. People will talk about, you know, the entire session, mm. but it's like, no, let's not do that. Let's talk about something that was a big win for you or even a little win. Little wins are it's good. something yeah. that will pick up your spirits because entrepreneurship is very, very tough. You don't have mm -hmm. to tell entrepreneurs that they know it. And that's why there are so few people who even attempt entrepreneurship, no less are successful at it. Yeah. It's a, it's a rare, it's a rare cat hmm. or kitten as it were, <laughs> yeah, who, true. um, who is going to say, you know what, I'm, I'm not, I'm not cut out for cubicle world. It's going to be my show. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I agree. And I think you're right. I mean, the, the work that I do with EOS is very much about putting a framework around how they run their business. I liken it to your operating system of your phone, for example, and then mm -hmm. you plug in other sure. things around it. And so I actually say to people, you know, you absolutely should have um, somebody else who's there to help you uh, with the leadership side of the business, with the coaching side of the business, um, because uh, my my job is around putting in the EOS. You still need help in other areas. Plug the other, the other apps in, if you like. <laughs> Well, yeah, you're, you're yeah. building the structural framework for them. Right. There's no different than the, my, you know, my codfish concept, which is, yes. you know, we have these silos and then I call them synapses that actually connect them. And many businesses, even in, even solopreneurs, uh, those synapses are broken or they were never established. Yeah. Right. So we want repeatable processes and procedures. It doesn't mean we're running a franchise, right? Where we're putting the fries in for, for seven minutes. Not like that. Nobody wants to do that. That's not why people wanted to be entrepreneurs. No, and we talk about, you know, you, you basically, um, what is it, you systemize the predictable so you can humanize the exceptional, which means that, like you, know, that. you have the framework that allows you to, people know what they need to do, but it gives them the opportunity then to actually be free to humanize the, the whole experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Hey, so when is the book, the next book coming out? Well, I got to finish writing it. So <laughs> <laughs> I just, I love the sound of it. I'm looking forward to seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. I've got a bunch of chapters done, but this, this book's even bigger. I mean, my yeah. FQ book is 432 pages. Yeah. Uh, I gave some hard copies to people and they're like, this is the heaviest book that I've ever had. I said, I don't know what to tell you. Yeah. Right. There's a lot of knowledge in there. So it's going to be heavy. Um, but, but I'm, I'm not in a, you know, I'm not in a rush. It's not, it's not like lives are in the balance. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, no, you know, my kids are going to eat, um, <laughs> whether the book gets published this week or <laughs> a year from now. So I, 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 um, I'm not, not to say that I'm a dilettante about it, but, um, I don't have quite the sense of urgency that I might've had, you know, 20 years ago. Yeah. Um, it's a little yeah. different stakes are a little different now at my age. I shall watch out for it with interest. Hey, um, we're, we're coming to the end of time. Before we finish up a couple of things, I'd love you to share sort of three tips that would really help the listeners in terms of running their business in a better way so they can have a better life. Um, and then also I'd love you to share with us you know, if people do want to contact you, if they want to get hold of the book, if they want to do the course, how would they actually do that? So let's start with the, the top three tips. So the, I guess, um, I use a lot of SaaS products. I'm sure a lot of folks that are out there mm -hmm. do, do as well. And what I've discovered is I use, I use a couple of sites. I use G2. I use Keptera. Again, a lot of those are paid for. I have clients that you know pay to be on those sites. Yep. 
I use another site that's called that's called Alternative Two. Um, the not every SaaS product is great, but beyond that, um, most products are partial solutions for whatever it is that you want to do. Yeah. Um, so I encourage people to not settle. Right. Use a product. But once you detect that it's not quite cutting it as your business evolves, but you look at it and you say, well, it's going to be really painful for me to change to something else. My suggestion is get over that. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. That's my tip. Yeah. It is. Yes, it is going to be painful. The benefits uh, will outweigh that later on. And I've seen it myself, even running, you know, a small life operation, I'll use a particular product and then I'll start banging into limitations on it and I'll get frustrated. And I'm saying, there's a lot of products, right? Mm -hmm. You go on G2 and it shows you a matrix, right? If you're going to do, if you're going to, um, uh, you know, you're looking for something for your sales team, you don't have to use Salesforce, I mean, there's a zillion of these CRM programs. Yeah. I've used a whole bunch of them, right? Whether it be uh, Insightly or Pipedrive or Monday or whatever. Mm -hmm. Don't be afraid to experiment with those things. And if it gets you get to a point where you're kind of hitting a wall and it, instead of getting frustrated, you or people who work for you say, hey, I'm going to charge you with finding me a replacement for this. Yep. It may cost you more money. It may be this, it may be that. In the long run, it's going to save you money. So that's, that's a, something I've learned experientially yeah. um, because you can, you can run any business from almost any business from a laptop these days. Yeah. Um, I guess another, another little tidbit, and I had a podcast earlier today and I kind of went on a little rant about this. So it's <laughs> sort of fresh in my mind. Um, that little PDF that I wrote, five reasons that small businesses fail. Well, no, yep. num the number two reason is hiring. Well, the number one reason, I'm not going to make you guess, um, <laughs> is your idea. Right. Basically, your idea sucks. Yep. <laughs> Just as simple <laughs> as that. Yep. Right? So whether it be the current business that you're running or a business that you might be thinking of, of, of running or spinning off, well, I started my, when we started our first IT company, we spun off a leasing company, mm -hmm. which was very successful and, and very um a very, very, um, probably the most lucrative business that I, that I ever owned. Um, and we created a whole separate corporation and the whole thing. Um, vet your ideas hard. Beat, I tell people, beat them up. Yep. Find, the, the, find a friend or a business associate who's always negative, right? Find that person. We all have them in our lives. Yeah. Mine happen to be my children, but that's a story for another. <laughs> uh, and pitch them on the idea and let them rip it to shreds. Yes. Right. Whatever it is, because you'll save an enormous amount of heartache and a lot of money by not executing ideas that are just not very good. It's actually interesting. We have a, we have an angel group over here, an angel investment group who actually run these drop-in sessions where you can take your idea and run it past them. Yep. And I love it because it's run by a guy called Rudy who's a friend of mine, German. He will just tell it absolutely as it is and he rips them to pieces. And I always feel really nervous about taking them in there, but it's like actually it's the best thing that can happen because it suddenly challenges because your friends and your family want to tell you usually, hey, oh, it's a wonderful idea. Yes, you should definitely do it. Oh, that's fabulous. <laughs> um, whereas these guys right. just give it to you as it is, which I think is, is just the, the best thing that can happen. <laughs> yeah, I was in an angel group, um, New York Angels, for a little while. Yeah. And um, and I would cover, I would have to cover my my eyes a couple of times with people in there because I just I felt terrible for them. Yeah. Um, but but they needed it. Yeah. They they needed that tough love. And that's that's hard to come by. That's mm -hmm. uh, there's some of that's a generational thing. Like, you know, you know, uh, I'm an old school boomer as I call myself. <gasps> We're not afraid to just give you the straight scoop and mm -hmm. we, we will admire people who will give it back to us in spades. But you have, again, I'm, not, I'm probably profiling an entire generation, but there's a generation that's kind of grown up avoiding controversy mm -hmm. or, or just texting instead of meeting face to face and looking someone in the eye. 
right? It's a lot different when you got to be in the same room with somebody and look at their nonverbal cues and their reactions, but it has to be done. It's the same thing with the, with the coaching. There are times where it's like, dude, I got to just tell you how it is, <laughs> right? Like this is your, this is, you got to, you got to rethink this. Mm. It's just, just doesn't work. Yeah. Right. So that's important. I agree. Right. Third and final. Oh, three. You're really going to make me stretch. Mm. Um, stretch Absolutely myself. Absolutely. I am. Yeah. Oh, okay. So um, money tools, right? Oh, so yeah. here, so we were talking about finance, so money mm-hmm. tools. So for, for my personal money, I use Quicken. It's the only yep. thing that, that actually works. Uh, and I've tried everything that's out there uh, at yep. one time or another. Um for business, um, the popular ones are either QuickBooks or Zero, right? Yep. I tried Zero. Uh, one of my clients was using it, so I downloaded it and did this. I actually replicated my books in Zero. It didn't work for my brain. It was much more, I don't know, it's just much diff- much more difficult, but but people swear by it. Yep. But the, my point is, stay up to date on that stuff, right? Uh, it's amazing how many clients are three months behind on their numbers. It's like yep. you can't run a business three months behind. Yeah. Right. You just can't yep. stay up to date. Yeah. Get the reports you need, understand the reports and mm-hmm. use those as a, as your crystal ball to help you extrapolate where this business is going so that you don't have to wait for it to happen. You can see it ahead of time. We, we talk about using scorecards to keep track of these things, looking at them weekly, because I just think that, you know, no matter what size of the business, there's always an excuse if it's a smaller business that they don't need to look at those things. But actually, no matter what size, if you're looking at things on a regular basis, you're picking up on the trends, you're picking up on the potential issues way before anything happens. I mean, we used to have small businesses when I was working at the Ice House who would not even look at their finances till the end of the year when the accountant would give them the report to say this is, you know, where, where you've got no. to. It's too no. late, you know. <laughs> don't 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 bury your head in the sand. Um, yeah, you know. Even though you know the reason that people don't do it is because they think that it's not going to like what they see. Well, yeah. you know what? Take your again. This is old school. Take your pain. Take it now, because you can then actually make some adjustments to do something about it, as opposed to waiting till it's all said and done. And I see this all the time in the in the you know coaching people in finance. It's like, you don't just buy a stock and then stick it somewhere and just, you know, revisit it occasionally. Yeah. I mean, I, I have a, a whole database that I do every morning before the markets open. I look at all these charts and, and futures and, and I've started, I added, even added Bitcoin and Ethereum and I look at them every day. So mm-hmm. I know what the price of oil is. Not only do I know that, but I know what direction it's going in. Yeah. Right. So I don't want to be blindsided. And even with all the work I do, I'm still, <laughs> I still get blindsided. <laughs> yeah, right? yeah, it's just what life. happens. Yeah, that's life. Yeah. No, it's interesting. It yeah, we, we do our level 10 meeting on a Monday morning. And, you know, throughout the, the pandemic, when we had very, very serious lockdowns, it affected our business significantly. And mm-hmm. it got to the point where it was like every week you're looking at the figures and thinking, oh, my goodness, you know, what's going to happen? And there was one point where I thought I should just stop doing this. This is really quite depressing. But it, it wasn't. In, in actual fact, it made us look at the business and go, we cannot sustain in this way. So what right. do we need to do differently to actually make sure that we can get through this? And I mm-hmm. think it was that almost that being looking at those numbers on such a regular basis and it was re- reinforcing it and it actually made us get off our asses and do something about it. <laughs> I'll leave you with one little little sort of um, statement that I, that I created and it's the difference yeah. between successful and unsuccessful people. Successful people make proactive decisions and they live with the consequences. Unsuccessful people abdicate the responsibility for making decisions to someone else and then whine about it when it doesn't go their way. Yeah. That is really the world in a nutshell. Yes. Love as, it. I, as I've seen it. Yeah. Perfect. Really good. Hey, look, um, it's been an absolute pleasure to talk to you. I really appreciate you sharing all of this wealth and knowledge. Um, if people would like to get in contact with you, if they want to get hold of your book, if they'd like to have a chat with you, how would they do that, Henry? 
So um, I have a, a, a vanity site, Henry Das, H-E-N-R-Y-D-A-A-S.com. And it has links to my business sites. It has links to, we, we spent three weeks in Africa. I've got my photos from, from Kenya in there and my, <laughs> the, my screenplays. You can read the first 10 pages of, of my screenplays. Awesome. Um, yeah. Uh, you can also download my book there for free. So it's right there on the main page. Just yeah. click on it and it'll take you through the little the little funnel. You'll yep. start getting my newsletters. You can always unsubscribe if you don't like my stuff, but you'll like my stuff. Of course. And um, and then you can, you know, read the book. Yeah. And uh, and then my my business site is called Das Knowledge, D-A-A-S Knowledge. Yep. Um, if you click up at the top where it says get my help, you can schedule a free strategy session. I don't, I don't you know, charge anybody to meet them Yep. and talk about whatever it is you want to talk about. If you want to talk about entrepreneurship, if you want to talk about personal finance, whatever it might be. Perfect. Hey, look, that is absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to be watching with interest to see when this Codfish Books comes out. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> but in the meantime, I'm going to go and download this book for myself and have a look and, and see um, what I can do to improve my Achilles heel. <laughs> okay. Excellent. So thank you for your time. Really appreciate it. You enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you, Deborah. Thanks very much.